We hear a lot about the second coming of Christ in scripture. This is especially true in the last part of the Trinity season. That event was spoken of many times during the ministry of Christ, an event that the people of that day did not understand any better than the people of today. The Bible speaks specifically of two appearances of Christ, the first of which we celebrate at Christmas time, the one in which he came in lowly form to a humble servant, coming to grant salvation to all those who would receive him. He came in a lowly form, in the form of a babe in a manger. We confess in the creed every Sunday that we believe in this coming. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. This is the first coming of Christ. And if it ended here, it would be meaningless. It would be totally irrelevant to our day. It would be something that happened over 2,000 years ago and would have no relationship to us in our world. But it doesn't end there. We believe more. We also believe in the second coming of Christ, one just as wonderful as the first. The creed continues. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. The first coming was for the purpose of saving mankind, the purpose of giving a sinful man a chance to reconcile himself by the grace of God. In the second coming, he will no longer be an advocate to appeal our case. He will then appear as a righteous judge and king over all creation. In the text today, we hear about that interim period, the period between these two great events. We are aware that his first and second coming are very recognizable. Christ, however, also comes to us today. He is a living reality to all who have been confronted by him in a personal encounter, to all who have heard his voice, to all who have felt his challenge and his saving power. But in what form does he come today? As we read in these texts, it becomes disconcerting. It could be very easily alarming. In the account in Matthew, Jesus tells us, in fact, that we are not likely to know when we have come face with him. Our actions at that point are not going to be affected by being before the judge when one might be expected to be on their best behavior. But it will be us in everyday reactions to those around us whom Jesus has commanded us to love. It becomes very apparent then that all who will come before the judgment have previously encountered the judge. He is going to say to each one, yes, I have met you before, and then we'll look on our face and we are going to hear him say, I met you one time as a young person in your school who didn't have the means to dress as nice as the standards of the community should say, and I was made fun of and avoided. I looked to you in friendship and understanding, and you turned away because I might laugh at you. I met you one time as a person who by accident of birth did not have the mental capability of normal people. And you avoided me because you considered me odd and different. And I made you feel very uncomfortable. I came to you once as once time as your son, disturbed and confused by life, in desperate need of your guidance and counsel. You were on your way to a meeting and you said, later son, I don't have time now. Don't bother me. Yes, he comes to us in the whole of life, yeah. not just on Sunday mornings as we sit and worship, but every day as we conduct our business, as we come in contact with all those around us, our neighbors, 
our friends, our family, and possibly those we don't really look on as friends, but as someone we really don't like. It is interesting to note here that Jesus is pointing out that the judge is not going to be concerned at that point with a person's creed, one's social standing, or his manner of worship, but with his reactions to those around, those who are in need. He mentions feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, and in prison. These, of course, are examples of those who cannot repay us, or at least we would not normally expect it. We define this type of thing as charity. In our society, we so often in our society, we so often define charity as the giving of money or material things. Most of us contribute quite generously to a number of causes throughout the year. We contribute to local, national, international relief organizations. We respond to emergency appeals for flood and tornado disasters, for relief for refugees or displaced persons. We respond to the work of our church through the budget in many areas in the form of pledges or special offerings. Through our money, we attempt to spread the gospel with its message of love and concern throughout the world that all may be brought to Christ and experience his love. Even though it might be, at times, be a point of criticism, I believe that if presented with a need we respond quite liberally with our money. However, the question raised by Jesus in our text is whether we are as liberal with our hearts. It is often much easier to give some money than it is to give of ourselves. It is rather easy to forget that the definition of charity should also include this. It must include this. Us. Jesus so often pointed out that we are not judged necessarily by the result, but by the intentions. We are made to understand that our concern is not to be centered on the second appearance of the king. We are shown that the decision at that point has already been made. There will not be any pleading of cases by the advocate, no reconsideration of the facts. The only thing remaining then will be the pronouncement of the judgment. The story is told of a man who was arrested on a criminal charge. He sought the help of a friend who was a distinguished lawyer and asked him if he would plead his case in court. But on the very day, his friend had been raised to the bench. Yesterday, he said, I would have been happy to plead your case. Today, however, I can only be your judge. Now, in an attempt to live life in the anticipation of having turned the wrong person away would be a frightening experience. All of life begins to sift down to that statement of Jesus when he was speaking to his disciples when they were concerned with who was going to sit where in the kingdom of God. Jesus said to them, He who would be great among you must be a servant. The classification of servant does not appeal to us because it often denotes something that might be undesirable. It also seems to designate a particular kind of status that does not sound very important to us. More important for the Christian, it says something about the lack of selfishness, a trait that we are usually quite generously endowed with. Whenever we attempt to keep the blessings we have received and the love with which we have been blessed, we don't let pass through us to others. We tend to become like a pool with out an outlet, stale and stagnant and die. This trait of selfishness is a dangerous one because when we are too concerned with ourselves,
we don't see or heed the needs of others. When we, by his grace, become less concerned about ourselves and let our lives become involved as a servant to others, and let the blessings that we have received flow through us, our lives will become, will become fresh and vibrant, and this life will take on new meaning for us. All of the things that we do for others will then become commonplace because we are not keeping a record of good deeds. We too will say with surprise, Lord, when saw we thee hungry and fed thee, or thirsty and gave you drink, when did we see you a stranger and take you in? It is necessary that we keep ourselves constantly aware of the fact that this life is critical. <coughs> what we did yesterday is already a matter of record. What we need to be concerned about are today and tomorrow, because our eternity is being decided. And now may the peace that passes. <coughs>